This is part two of the series on backlash, deflection and vibration on the Shapoko. In this part, we'll answer why we care about deflection and backlash, take a look at how deflection in the machine interacts with cutting forces to create vibration and resonance and thus limits our cutting speeds, see what sort of frequencies these vibrations and resonances occur at, propose one answer to why cutting vibration and resonance seems to be worse in deep and better in shallow cuts, and finally take a quick look at the Shapoko as an overall system of deflections. So, why do we care? Well, there are two main reasons to care about deflection and backlash in the machine. The first is ultimate accuracy. While we can achieve some pretty impressive accuracy with a Shapoko, this frequently involves several rounds of cutting, measuring, fiddling with the cam to incrementally approach the final dimension we require. This can be somewhat time consuming and make our CAD CAM models more complex as we make the compensating adjustments. If we take roughing passes to cut out the bulk of the material and then finishing passes to get to final dimension, our deflection due to cutting load is minimal in the finishing pass. It should then only be backlash that prevents us from approaching the step size limiting precision of the machine. The second concern is cutting speed. When we cut, we generate forces. The machine needs to resist these forces and keep the cutter and workpiece where they're supposed to be. Deflection in the machine affects the cut, but more significantly allows vibration to develop. In particular, there are modes where the machine tends to resonate. These can build a positive feedback loop where the vibration periodically varies cutter engagement, and therefore the cutting force is reinforcing itself and increasing the amplitude. In practice, the impact of vibrations and resonances can vary from poor finish through breaking cutters, damaging the workpiece, pulling the workpiece loose, or even damage parts of the machine. So, deflection primarily limits the speed at which we can cut and potentially the quality of finish, whilst backlash primarily limits our final accuracy. Let's just take a moment to explain how I measured. Most measurements were taken with this dial gauge. On its mounting base and arm, the dial gauge allows me to measure down to 0.01 millimetres between whatever the base is mounted to and the tip of the dial. In some cases, that's the spoil board and spindle for overall deflection, or a more specific measurement such as Z carriage left right movement against the X beam. One full rotation of the outer dial represents 1 millimetre. The tick marks are hundredths of a millimetre, so a Shapoko step is around 2.5 tick marks. The smaller dial indicates full millimetre, so here the machine is stepping full millimetres left and right. We see a full rotation of the main dial and one step on the small dial. Stepping in 0.25 millimetre increments, we see we get a quarter turn of the dial for each step. And here we're down at the minimum step size of the Shapoko, stepping 0.025 millimetres each time. First, what do we mean by the terms backlash, slack and deflection? Well, backlash is lost movement in the linear motion system where we request a change in direction. For a typical rack and pinion, ball screw or lead screw driven linear motion system, we can visualise backlash as being like carrying a bowling ball in a box. The ball is broadly constrained to go with the box, but each time we reverse direction we have to move the box far enough for the ball to hit the opposite wall before it follows the box. On the Shapoko, backlash occurs through a different mechanism and presents slightly differently. Here's backlash on the x-axis, we're measuring close to the belt to reduce the influence of other movements such as v-wheel deflection. The machine's being stepped in full millimetre steps, but you can see when it changes direction the dial doesn't quite come back to zero. Slack is very similar to backlash in that it gives a range of position the machine may be in when no force is applied. The distinction, for our purpose, is that slack occurs not due to the drive belts, but simply through slack in the mechanism, such as the V-wheels, which allow movements not controllable by the motors and belts. Deflection is where the machine moves from the requested position due to forces encountered while cutting, or by the operator. Some of this deflection comes from flexing parts of the machine, some of it comes from stretching the drive belts and drive mechanism. When cutting, deflection can cause a couple of problems. First, it can cause cutter engagement to be larger or smaller than we intended. This affects the cutting load. Second, and more of a problem on a light machine like the Shapoko, is the machine can start to vibrate and resonate with the deflection of the cutting loads. So let's look at deflection, vibration and resonance. The major limit to cutting speed on the Shapoko is vibration of the spindle or workpiece induced by cutting forces. 
it's rare to run out of spindle power or torque before encountering one of these vibration modes. Most users have experienced this when pushing their machine into too heavy a cut where small vibrations can rapidly build up into large vibrations which are then difficult to suppress. When examining this system, not all our deflections are equal when it comes to vibration. So it's worth taking a look at the vibration and resonance issues before we move on into deflection and backlash, as these are the primary issues arising out of the machine deflection. Before discussing the vibrations in machining, let's take a moment to define a few terms and describe what part they play. To think about vibrations, consider a simple mass on a spring, like a vehicle on a suspension spring. As the mass moves, the spring compresses or extends. The spring wants to be in the middle, so it works to reverse the movement. There's a frequency at which each mass and spring combination likes to move, its resonant frequency. The lighter the mass, or the stronger the spring, the higher that frequency. There's usually some sort of damping taking place as well to reduce the movement. The greater this damping, the faster the mass will stop moving when the force is no longer applied. And the smaller the maximum amplitude of the movement if we continue to excite the mass at that resonant frequency. This is why old cars bounce up and down quite easily, but new cars with working shock absorbers don't. So, chatter, vibration, and resonance. In traditional milling machines, the phenomenon of chatter is relatively well understood. Machine, tool, and workpiece deflections interact with cutting forces to excite a resonant vibration in the machine, thus producing the characteristic chatter sound and other issues such as marks on the workpiece. Various rules of thumb exist to avoid or manage chatter, such as keeping tool deflection due to cutting forces below one thousandth of an inch, or plotting stability load diagrams of your machine and tool combination. This is not a simple process, and there's actually a range of ways in which your machine can vibrate in these undesirable modes and affect the cutting performance. At one end, we have high frequency vibrations, in the range of our high speed spindles rotational speeds, where relatively small masses, such as cutters or parts of the workpiece, vibrate on very stiff springs, such as the deflection of the carbide cutting tool or a wall in the workpiece. At the other end, we have lower frequency vibrations where relatively heavy parts of our machine assembly vibrate against much less stiff springs. One example of this is the Z carriage and spindle assembly vibrating on the drive belt spring. These large vibrations are interacting with the cutting forces on the machine. When the machine's cutting, we have a series of things going on. The cutter is rotating at a target speed, it's being fed through the workpiece at a feed rate, and it has some depth and width of cut. All of this adds up to the cut we're taking, or trying to take. Once the cut starts, the cutter produces force between the spindle and the workpiece. These forces on the cutter are shown simplified for a climb cut below. These would be inverted for conventional cutting. These forces inevitably deflect the cutter and workpiece some amount. When the cutter deflects away from the cut, as caused by the cutting forces shown, the engagement reduces, and thus the cutting forces. The machine then tends to spring back into the cut. If the workpiece deflects, we have the same outcome. When the machine swings back and deflects the cutter further into the cut, the engagement increases, the cutting force increases, in this case pushing the cutter back away from the cut. So, we have a system where the deflecting forces are affected by that deflection. If this happens at a frequency at which the tool, workpiece or machine can resonate, then we have a positive feedback system, which can rapidly achieve a large displacement. The problem with these resonance modes, especially when they have little damping, is that once excited they can be hard to escape. They can develop a lot of energy and will continue to feed themselves with energy while the cut continues. There's a rather famous video of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge which demonstrates why resonance can be quite bad. Worse, the vibrations also leave variations in the cut surface, and these can trigger the same vibration on the next pass of that cut. Returning to our vehicle analogy, once the road starts to washboard, it can be very hard to get away from that vibration. There are various well understood methods and tools for larger machines. From test cuts through to specialised test hardware which measures the cutter and machine resonance. These identify the problem frequencies and provide feeds and speeds or charts to avoid them. This knowledge is less well developed for hobby grade machines. So, what sort of frequencies might we expect on a Shapoko? For vibrations triggered directly by the cutter rotation at spindle speed, we'd expect to see frequencies somewhere in the range of 200Hz to 2 kHz. Vibrations at these frequencies are generally not visible to the naked eye. When you see a speaker comb moving, its base frequency is not mid-range. However, 
in addition to simple spindle frequency vibration, we also have the lower frequency modes which are not directly responding to spindle speed, but instead build up in the machine as resonance. Going back to our simple mass on a spring, we can do some simple calculations to find out what sort of frequencies we might see. Let's take one element of the Shapoka, the Z carriage and spindle, and isolate it from the rest of the machine. We'll assume the spindle is deflecting left to right on the x-axis rail and opposed by the spring and the drive belt. Taking the values from my machine, we get an approximate resonant frequency of 22 Hz, which is consistent with the visible resonance modes I've observed on my machine, and much lower than spindle speeds. This vibration does have some damping, primarily the rolling resistance of the V-wheels, and this is perhaps another reason why high V-wheel pretension does seem to help on the machine. To try to improve this performance, we might add mass, say a water-cooled spindle instead of a trim router. Unfortunately, the outcome is more complex. The additional mass does lower the resonant frequency, but it increases the amplitude when resonance does occur. However, at higher frequencies above the resonance, it will reduce the amplitude of the vibrations. Digging a little further, we find the source of one of the large differences between the standard size Shapoko 3 and the XXL machine. Taking the X-beam rigidity for the XL and XXL, which we look at later on, and using this as the spring for the Z carriage assembly vibrating backward and forward this time, we see that we have a resonant frequency of about 34 Hz. However, if we take the standard size Shapoko 3 with the shorter X-beam, we have a much smaller deflection for the same force. This higher spring constant gives us a resonant frequency almost three times higher than the long X-beam, and suggests that the trigger feeds and speeds for this mode would be quite different on the standard size machine. One common observation about both the Shapoko and Nomad machines is that to achieve the maximum cutting rate, one should use a shallow but wide cut instead of a deep but thin cut. We know that in a resonance mode we have feedback between deflection and cutting force, so taking two cuts with the same cutter engagement, one deep, one shallow, if we allow both cuts to deflect horizontally by the same amount, we see that the shallow cut only sees 20% extra engagement, while the deep cut sees double the engagement and therefore cutting force. It's also worth noting that cutters with a high helix angle, i.e. not straight flutes, the deeper cuts will also create significant vertical forces to excite the coupled Z and Y nodding deflection. Again, more on that later. We can look at the main parts of the Shapoko as a connected system of masses and springs. Here's a simplified diagram which illustrates some of the main components in which I've measured deflection. On the left we have cutting, which creates force between our workpiece and cutter. The forces and their resulting deflections and vibrations then travel to the right, through the components of the machine, until we reach the mounting base. This system is, unfortunately, quite complex to model and analyse. However, modern computer simulation tools can provide some excellent insight into this. Hopefully, somebody with those skills will have something to say about that. What we can do now is look at the system and identify that we have several large sources of deflection close to the cutter, and that these are likely to be our major targets to reduce slack, improve rigidity, and if possible, increase damping. First, Z-axis and spindle rotating due to V-wheel radial deflection. Second, Z-axis and spindle nodding due to V-wheel axial deflection. Third, Z-axis and spindle translating left to right against belt tension. Finally, on the XXL machine, the bouncy baseboard. In the next part, we'll look at each of these deflection modes in more detail, using measurement data to understand how much deflection or vibration we might expect from each. We'll also dig into the belt system to understand how belt deflection works, including how and why this varies with X and Y position on the machine. Finally, we'll put this all together into deflection maps of the machine, compare the different deflection behaviour of the Shapoko 3 and XXL, and look at a couple of upgrade options.